2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, we'll begin with verse 1, and I invite you to stand with me as you're able to in honor the reading of God's word this morning. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be reminded of the words which were spoken before by holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then perished, that then existed, perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him, by him, in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. Early in World War II, President Roosevelt ordered General MacArthur to leave the Philippines and go to Australia. General MacArthur regretted the order, but he made a promise to the Filipino people. You probably have heard it before. He said, I shall return. The people of the Philippines, they hung on to that promise that General MacArthur would come back there someday. And in 1945, General MacArthur waded ashore to the Philippines and declared, I have returned. He fulfilled his promise to the people of the Philippines. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he spoke of his return to earth. In essence, saying, I shall return. And like General MacArthur, he will keep his promise. He will return. 
He indicated that after his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension back to heaven, he would come in a glorious manner. Jesus is coming back again. You can count on it. He will return. Now, we've talked about it before in church. We've seen it on billboards. We've seen it. We, we've heard it proclaimed from pulpits. We've heard it proclaimed across the airwaves. We've seen it on signs. Jesus is coming back again. Do you believe it? Yes, amen. amen. Do you believe that he will literally return to the earth to claim his own? If you believe it, do you see it as some distant future event? Something that will never affect you in this life? Or do you see it as something that could happen today? It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow or next week. So many people view the second coming, the return of Jesus as Something that has no bearing on their lives whatsoever. And if you don't believe in the literal, physical return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have a faith problem. And it would behoove you to get into the Word of God, claim the promises of Christ. He's told us that He'll return. And He never has made a promise he hasn't kept, has he? If you see the return as some distant event that has no effect on the way you live today, think again. You see, the return of Christ is going to cause great division in this world when it happens. It'll cause division in families, relationships, governments, even churches where some will be taken and some will be left behind. And it's all based upon each individual person's relationship with Jesus Christ. The thing about it is when Christ returns, sadly, it's going to be too late for anyone to be saved. When He returns... You'll be out of chances. But if you're saved, when Christ returns, you don't have to worry about being left behind. And if that's your case this morning, I say, praise God. But there's still reason for us to be concerned. What about our families? What about our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors? Do we care enough about them to be concerned for their eternal souls? We don't know when he's going to return. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be in a hundred years. He, Peter talks about God speaking through Peter. Talks about a day being has a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And what he's talking about is in heaven there is no time. Time ceases to exist. It's all eternity. It's all eternity. That's a difficult concept for us to grasp. It's hard for us to understand. We can't guess when Christ is going to return. Only God knows. And even if He were to return in our lifetime, who's to say that each and every one of us will live long enough to make sure we're right with Him before He returns? Because every day people are leaving us, young and old. The Bible tells us 
It is appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. That means that none of us are guaranteed another minute, another day or month or year. I hope that all of us here already know Jesus. Already have a relationship with Him. But the foregone conclusion is that each of us will experience death. We're not getting out of here alive. Christ's return is not a trivia question. It's a solid fact. He's coming back. So I want us to consider just what that means to us. First of all, the Lord's return fulfills a promise. I don't know a lot, but I cannot, you know, I, I can't give you a, a long list of absolutes in life. But one thing I can say with absolute certainty is that Jesus Christ is going to return. And how do we know that? We know that, first of all, because of the Old Testament prophets. If you read through the Old Testament, you notice a theme. Even before the birth of Christ, there was an anticipated day of the Lord by the prophets. These prophets didn't see all the details, but they knew when the world as they knew it was over, God would have the final word. So the Old Testament prophets have promised us that Christ is going to return. But He Himself, Jesus, He has also promised. So if the words of the prophets proclaiming the day of the Lord is not enough, look at the words of Jesus in the New Testament. He promises His return to earth. The theme of our Lord's return, it prevails in His teachings. It prevails in His parables. He's constantly warning people to be right and be ready that He's coming back. We see it in the parables of the owner. We see it in the the, the parables of the ten virgins. We see it in many of the parables. He's going to return. After reading the New Testament, there's no question that Jesus Himself knew that He was going to return. But also, we know from other New Testament writers that Christ is going to return. Peter talks about it right here. We read words of assurance for His return in the third chapter of Acts. Luke reports that immediately following His ascension to heaven, two of the angels from heaven confirmed His second coming. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen Him go into heaven. He's going to return. The most vocal New Testament writer concerning Christ's return had to be the Apostle Paul. Throughout his letters, Paul reminds his readers that Jesus is coming back. Anyone who reads the Bible will notice there is a promise to all that Jesus is going to return. He will rapture the church. He will fulfill His promise. Secondly, the Lord's return accomplishes a purpose. There's a definite purpose for His return. According to Peter, it's a threefold purpose. First of all, the Lord will return to judge the world. Just as He came to our world that first Christmas for a specific purpose, so He will the second time. 
His first coming was to save the world. His return is to judge the world. Look again at verse 10. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The logical question that a person might have at this point is what will be the basis of his judgment? And it's very simple. It's the same gospel message we preached for generations. For more than 2,000 years. The basis of the judgment is on one's relationship with him. Do we know him? Do we have a relationship with Christ? See, Jesus won't be interested in how much money we've acquired, how many friends we've made, what positions we might hold. He, he's not going to care about where we live or the color of our skin. He won't look at the brand of car we're driving. Or the ball team we pull for. He won't even care if we're charter members of the best church on earth. What he will consider only is whether or not he knows us. Get that? Not that we know who he is. Not that we think we know him because we went to church and learned a lot. But whether or not he knows us. And so the question is, do you have such a relationship with Jesus Christ? One that will cause him to recognize you. I remember throughout my life hearing the great Billy Graham preach. Seen him on TV hundreds of times. Even attended some, some services where he preached. I've read many of his books. I actually knew his brother was friends with his brother and had him preach for me many times. In junior high school, I dated his cousin's daughter. and She knew him from family reunions. But you know, if I had stood before Billy Graham, he wouldn't have known who I was. Because I had never met him. I knew a lot about him. But I had never met him. We would never been acquainted. He wouldn't have known me. I could say I know him. And I can tell you a lot about him. But he didn't know me. Likewise there are a lot of people in our world today. Who know a lot about Jesus. They've read the Bible. They've attended church. Maybe they went to a Christian school. They know a lot about Jesus. They can answer a lot of questions. The question that's most important is whether he knows them. Does Jesus know you? Will he recognize you? Or will he say, away from me, I never knew you? Doesn't matter what we've convinced people we know. Does he recognize us? Also, the Lord will return to actualize the fullness of the kingdom of God. The fullness. Now, understand this the kingdom of God is a reality now, but the time will come when we will know the kingdom of God in all its fullness. See, as long as Christ tarries, Satan is going to continue to have his way in the hearts and lives of men and women and boys and girls. Millions of people worldwide will be led by Satan. And as long as that happens, we can't fully know the kingdom of God in this life. But we get a taste of it. We get a taste of it when we're together with God's people, for sure. 
The Lord's also going to return to reorient the world. Peter said this present sinful order will pass away be destroyed by fire. There'll be a new heaven. A new earth. We read about it in, in the Revelation. The theologians, they, they, they debate Peter's language as they do just about everything. They, they, some say it's literal language he's using here. Some say it's figurative. But you and I can know that this is a clear message from God. When Jesus returns, He will reorient the whole cosmological structure of the world. There's a definite reason for Christ's return. Finally, there's a fact of His second coming means something else very important. The Lord's return encourages preparation. Preparation. Knowing that Christ has promised to return, that His return is a a return with definite purpose. It should cause every human being who's ever heard the gospel message to get themselves prepared. But how do we do that? First of all, the Lord encourages readiness. In our text, Peter urges his readers to be ready for the Lord's return. And Jesus also encourages that in the 24th chapter of Matthew. He said, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And what that means is every, every book, every video, every message that tells us that Jesus is coming at a particular day and hour is a false message, a false gospel. Jesus is returning, but none of us knows when. We don't know the day or hour. He's coming quickly. And we've got to be prepared. When he returns, the destiny of each individual on earth will be decided. We need to trust him now. We need to grow in his ways while we have the opportunity to do so. So my question is very simple for you this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready for his return? Secondly, the Lord's return encourages godliness. In verse 11, Peter says, since everything is going to be destroyed on that day, what kind of people ought you to be? What kind of person should you be? He says you should live holy and godly lives. Knowing that our Lord is returning. It it challenges us to live by His principles. It's not the only reason we do so. We are obedient because we love Him. But knowing that He's going to return gives us that extra motivation. Kind of like the Teenager who spends the weekend at home alone. I see some of you have done that before. I see the smile on your face. They don't necessarily worry about how things look in the house, do they? In fact, they may destroy the house. But as the weekend begins to close and the realization that the parents are going to return soon, begins to clear the junk begins to clean up the mess the only difference in this is that we don't know when Jesus is going to return we need to do that every day 
We need to be prepared every day. We need to live every day as if today is the day He'll return. Finally, this morning, the Lord's return encourages service. If you read the Bible, cover to cover, you'll see that in almost every mention of the Lord's return, there's also the mention of service. That means you and I have jobs to do for Him. In light of the fact that so much needs to be done before His return, that so many people need to be reached before His return, we should work with great zeal. Would you consider this for a moment? Will the things that matter most to you, will they matter at all after Christ's return? Are they things that you, can, that you can say to God, here's what I've done with my life on earth. And I did it to glorify you. Or will He look at what you've done and say, what does that have to do with eternity? What's most important to you these days? Do the things that you're working your hardest for have any eternal value whatsoever? After Christ returns, will the goals that you've achieved mean anything at all to Him? Will He say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or will He say, depart from me, I never knew you? There are many noble and worthy pursuits in this world. Many things you can do to make yourself a better person. But if Jesus Christ is not number one, you're striving in vain. It's all for naught. I would dare say that the majority of people sitting in this room and in church pews all around the world perhaps not placing the things of God as their highest priorities. Not everyone, but many. See, it's not going to matter how many no-hitters we pitched when we get to heaven. It's not going to matter how many home runs we hit. It's not going to matter how many wise investments we made. It's not going to matter how many fish we caught or how many birdies we sank. What's going to matter is if we trusted Jesus Christ and placed Him and His purposes as our number one priority in all areas of life. None of those things are bad in and of themselves. If Christ has his proper place. If he is our number one priority in all we do. Jesus is going to come back to earth. He came the first time he was despised. He was rejected. His second coming is going to involve every human being who's ever lived. Including you and me. For many, it's going to be a disastrous day because they won't be prepared. They won't know Him and He won't know them. I hope you're prepared. And I praise God if you are. The question remains, are we sharing this good news with other people so they too can be prepared? See, everyone needs to be ready. Christ's great comeback. He is coming again. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. If you're here today and you're not prepared, I'm going to make this very simple. You're not prepared for His return if He were to come this afternoon. I want to give you the opportunity to get prepared. 
to come and kneel at this altar to get things right with him. In fact, we still got water back there. If you feel like you need to be baptized, we can do that today before you leave. It's urgent that we're all prepared. If you're not 100% certain that you're prepared today, I want you to leave here with that certainty. Heavenly Father, you know each heart. Where we stand before you. Help us to not be deceived. About our condition before you. But to have 100% certainty. Before we leave this place today. That we're ready. For the second coming. We're ready. For Christ to return. Father, it's all for you. For your praise and glory. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.